I'm having a conversation uh, today with uh, Chris Forsmark about uh, chronic pancreatitis. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the signs and symptoms of chronic pancreatitis, uh, when they occur, do they all occur at once, are they surrogates of each other, or can they occur independent of each other? And we've uh, talked briefly about a case of a young woman who uh, developed panc acute pancreatitis and a pain syndrome and had uh, a, a very thorough workup. And I thought maybe it would be worthwhile taking just a few minutes to talk about how a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis is made at, uh, at your university. I think that the, um, certainly pain is the most common symptom that we might see from chronic pancreatitis, and I think all clinicians are aware of that. What's not known sometimes, I think, is that the pain has a variety of different uh, types, and that some patients may have relatively minor pain, other patients may have severe pain, some may be intermittent, some may be continuous, and it changes over time in many patients so that it may increase or decrease or stay the same as the disease progresses. And it's important that a significant minority of patients don't have pain at all. They present with other symptoms or with imaging evidence of chronic pancreatitis. So pain is not a universal feature for chronic pancreatitis, and the character of the pain is quite variable. So I think when you again, read a textbook and it says that the pain has to be continuous, severe, boring epigastric pain with radiation to the back. You'll see many patients that don't have pain that's uh, uh, similar to that. So I guess the first point I would make about pain is that uh, you should suspect the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis uh, in a wide variety of clinical situations and a wide variety of different types of pain. It's clear that uh, pain, though, is common and it's the symptom that most seriously detracts from quality of life. It's interesting, we've done studies together right. to look at the, the character of pain and uh, patients that have episodic pain, even if it's very severe, uh, feel much better about their quality of life than patients who have continuous, uh, unrelenting pain, even if, if it's of less severity. That's a good point because uh, we've often used the criteria of pain severity to determine whether or not that was affecting the quality of life but in fact, it's the chronic pain that never goes away, and there doesn't seem to be a hope for eliminating it, whether it's severe or mild. That's what causes the disability, the frustration, the anxiety, the dysfunction, the loss of work, job, um, school, and uh, depression. Uh, if there's a severe pain that they know is going to end, uh, it's still pancreatitis, but it doesn't affect them in the same way, and that's uh, something that we just never expected and was a very important finding. And it was a, a, um, a very interesting and exciting new finding, but I, I think in, perhaps in retrospect we should have suspected that as sort of common human responses to if you put yourself in the, pla in the pace of the, the place, pardon me, of the patient, you would be, uh, you would suspect that that type of pain would be the most overwhelming. And I think linking the quality of life to pain, uh, that was very interesting as well because people with the chronic pain have the low quality of life, and we never really paid attention to that in the past, I think, the way we should have. The young lady that we discussed, the case we discussed, right. was very much troubled by pain, and it had really um, uh, had a huge impact on her life. What she didn't have, though, were some of the other symptoms that we commonly see in patients with chronic pancreatitis, uh, which would be uh, symptoms due to exocrine insufficiency or steatorrhea, and symptoms due to endocrine insufficiency or diabetes. And these can occur at variable time for, uh, points throughout the disease process, typically later in the disease process than pain, uh, but they may present without pain. And so we may see patients who have steatorrhea or diarrhea as their primary uh, um, uh, presentation, uh, perhaps coupled with fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. We may see patients that present with symptoms of diabetes, such as polyuria or polydipsia, as their first a presentation of disease or patients that are identified through you know, hemoglobin A1C screening by their primary care doctor. So it's really these three uh, dominant uh, types of uh, symptoms, the symptoms due to steatorrhea, the symptoms due to diabetes, and the symptoms of pain that can be really mixed and matched in any possible combination within an individual patient and can change over time. And so again, if you sort of think about the, the textbook definition, be aware that many of these patients 
may not have pain, and you're going to have to suspect the disease on other, uh, other grounds. I think the, the uh, other point that you've, you've made and have been um, very uh, thoughtful about is that we're a little bit confused in the field of pancreatitis uh, because we don't separate the inflammation from the fibrosis. And you've pointed out that in liver diseases, there's a difference between hepatitis and cirrhosis. And when those two distinctions are made, we can understand you can have hepatitis without cirrhosis and uh, cirrhosis with minimum uh, visible uh, active inflammation. And uh, we've never really done that uh, with the pancreas. And I think that's it's a weakness in our field, uh, quite frankly. I would think we think about the variety of endpoints that patients can develop, which would be pain or exocrine insufficiency or endocrine insufficiency or even cancer, which they're obviously at increased risk for. But we don't think about the processes that lead to those endpoints in terms of what are the initial uh, insults, what role does inflammation have in driving fibrosis, and then what role does fibrosis have in driving some of these other features. I certainly believe, and I know you do as well, that patients can have severe pain and have very little fibrosis. Right. The inflammatory uh, process within the gland affects the nerves, drives the pain, but it's not, if you looked at a piece of pancreas from a patient like that, and you were relying on a histologic definition of chronic pancreatitis, you would not be able to reach a diagnosis because they don't have fibrosis. And another important uh, caveat is that those same patients uh, that are having pain and there's clearly something wrong with the pancreas, uh, our diagnostic criteria requires a structural or functional change. We do CT scans, ERCPs, endoscopic ultrasounds. There's hints. Nobody can make the call for sure, waiting for the fibrosis to occur. And the functional testing is uh, cumbersome. It's difficult. Only a few centers in the United States offer that as routine. And uh, the uh, uh, fecal elastase test that's commonly used requires a significant and irreversible damage to the pancreas in most cases before it's positive. So we're really stuck in a dilemma of uh, requiring almost structural diagnosis for a disease that can go on for years before structural changes are seen. Another thing that you pointed out is sometimes patients present with pancreatic insufficiency without pain. And those patients often uh, have sort of a shrunken atrophic pancreas Usually older patients, unexpected, they have weight loss, uh, diarrhea, maybe some vitamin deficiencies and, and uh, other diseases. Uh, is that actually chronic pancreatitis or what is it? Because from your definition, that could possibly be included in the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. Yeah, I think we're at a loss because we don't have the right nomenclature to describe these various uh, conditions that can exist within the pancreas. Um, some have proposed this idea of sort of a bland fibrosis of the gland as being somehow separate from chronic pancreatitis, or the patient you described who's clearly had some uh, significant and long-standing event that's been occurring in the pancreas that ultimately led to failure of the gland, to exocrine failure, um, but has never had pain. So I'm not sure what to call those people. I guess I would still include them under the broad heading of chronic pancreatitis, but I would uh, widen what the definition of chronic pancreatitis is. I would include many, many different variants uh, within that overarching uh, diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. As long as we're you know, smart enough to recognize those variants, identify them, and even more importantly, determine what the implication of that is. What's the therapeutic implication of these different uh, subtypes? Does it mean that treatment is different for those different subtypes? And presumably it is. I've seen a number of elderly patients who present in just the way you're describing. And it's interesting that many of them don't actually even note diarrhea. They have massive steatorrhea, so they may have 60 grams of fat but they only have one bowel movement a day. And so it's never suspected that they might have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency uh, because we, we, you know, we rarely measure stool fat and they're not having diarrhea, but it's noted that they're losing weight 
and that they're developing osteoporosis and they have other fat soluble vitamin deficiencies and nobody ever even considers the possibility this might be due to exocrine insufficiency. So those are very good points because the classic signs and symptoms uh, having to do with uh, maldigestion, for example, um, can be affected by diet and by other factors so that you don't see uh, classic you know, oil in the stool or those types of things. So the signs and symptoms can be subtle even though the disease is uh, um, uh, pretty advanced in, in uh, many cases. But I think that what we've described, we're, we're almost bringing full circle. The term chronic pancreatitis doesn't really have a, uh, a meaning of, of inflammation necessarily. It means that there's pathology in the pancreas that is ongoing and that it has a variety of signs and symptoms and that various combinations can qualify for this uh, ongoing uh, pancreatic disorder. I think that we are becoming a little bit smarter about teasing out some of these signs and symptoms and pinpointing the, uh, the elements of the syndrome that uh, are causing uh, pathology. Uh, how this is eventually pulled together and, uh, and treated is uh, yet to be seen. But for now, I think that the diagnosis uh, category of uh, chronic pancreatitis is the best that we have.